Hello, my name is Darren Norton. I was born and bred in Brandon, Suffolk, and for the past two decades, I have been researching life in the town for those who lived through the war years. This year, 2021, sees the 80th anniversary of some dramatic events that took place in Brandon, of which very few people are aware. And yet, upon reflection, they could have been utterly disastrous for the town's residents. To mark this anniversary, I thought I would share my research with you. For those who don't know, Brandon is situated in the northwestern end of the county of Suffolk, on the border with Norfolk, close to the fens of Cambridgeshire, and about 15 miles from Bury St Edmunds. Over the centuries, both Suffolk and Norfolk have laid claims to parts of Brandon, and yet it really couldn't get any further from Ipswich and Norwich, the respective county towns, and still be under their influence. The town even straddles the border between Norfolk and Suffolk. One story goes that a doctor once asked which room the patient was in so that he could then determine if they were within his catchment or if another doctor across the border would have to visit. Today, Brandon is perhaps best known as a place that travellers merely pass through. However, those in the know will tell you its real claim to fame is its flint napping, especially the part it played in the Battle of Waterloo. Did you know that the town was the sole supplier of gun flints to the soldiers under Wellington's command? The black flint of Brandon was far superior to that of the French. It gave up to 50 strikes before needing to be replaced, whereas the French ones gave about 20. This meant the French took more time out from firing to replace their flints. At their height, Brandon flint nappers were churning out up to a million gun flints a month. And it is often said that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the fields of Eton. But perhaps the flint napping sheds of Brandon played a significant part too. I digress. That's a story of Brandon's contribution to a war in Europe. And that's a story for another day. Instead I'm going to tell you when the war in Europe came to Brandon. If such action happened today it would have made front page news. There would have been inquests into how it happened and what could have been done to stop it happening again. And yet, because it took place when hundreds and sometimes thousands across the world were being killed every day and bad news was being censored from the public eye, few people outside Brandon got to hear about it. Even today, most Brandon residents remain unaware. 80 years ago, back in February 1941, the Second World War was raging across Europe, the Middle East and on the Atlantic Ocean. By this time, Brandon had already lost four men to the fighting, three of them in the retreat to Dunkirk, and a fourth when his plane crashed in Libya. The enemy seemingly had the upper hand, and the German air force, the Luftwaffe, were bombing and killing British civilians in what was known as the Blitz. Although by no stretch of the imagination was Brandon a priority of the Luftwaffe, it had all the same not escaped the attention of the enemy. Up to 1941, a handful of outlying farms had received a few high explosive bombs and incendiaries, but apart from a shed and some telephone wires, there was little damage to report. But at 8 pm on Thursday, the 30th of January 1941, Calder's timber yard near the railway line was hit with six incendiary bombs, which caused damage to two saw machines. Coincidentally, this date was also the eighth anniversary of the Nazis coming to power in Germany. Also hit that night was Mayday Farm, Wangford Warren and Fish Ponds, although there were no casualties other than a few trees in the forest. It was probably unlikely that the latter three locations were random targets, after all they were in the vicinity of RAF Lakenheath. Back in 1941 the airbase was not recognisable as we see it today. In fact it was not even operational but instead it was a dummy airfield set up to draw the enemy bombers away from nearby RAF bases such as Mildenhall, Feltwell and Methwold. The locals knew about the airfield. A Brandon ironmonger had a contract to supply wire for fencing and it was hoped the Germans would discover it too. As a decoy, the airfield contained no real aircraft. If you looked under the camouflage netting then you would have seen the aircraft were simply Tate and Lyle sugar boxes with broom handles for guns. At night, oil lamps were lit to mimic runway landing lights. If the enemy dropped their bombs over this fake runway, then it meant that the real runways remained operational and the Royal Air Force could continue to take the fight to the enemy. Then on Thursday the 27th of February 1941, in broad daylight and while the town residents were going about their daily lives, 
the enemy arrived and attacked. Les Bond was one of the first in Brandon to see it. At the time, he was a young man working in a lime quarry just off the Thetford Road. When he wasn't working, Les was part of Brandon's home guard and had undergone training to distinguish the different engine sounds of aircraft. So he was somewhat caught off guard when on that day he heard something he thought was an enemy aircraft. It was getting louder, closer. He and a colleague stopped working and looked up to the skies. Then suddenly, above the edge of the quarry, it appeared in front of them. A German bomber so low, Les could see the faces of the crew inside. If only he had his home guard rifle to hand, he could have taken a pot shot at it. From the bottom of the quarry, Les's glimpse of the bomber was fleeting, but he did see it head towards the town centre. Moments later, he heard the rattle of machine gun fire. We sent him diving under a truck for cover. Next to see the bomber were a line of women who were waiting to return to work at the end of their lunchtime. This was at the fur processing factory in George Street. The aircraft was following the route of Thetford Road, so those who know Brandon will know that George Street spurs just off Thetford Road. Just like Les, the women would have heard the aircraft long before seeing it in full view. Perhaps they stared, stunned at seeing a mythical beast in broad daylight descending upon the town. Then it unleashed a spray of machine gun bullets, which in an instant, any single one of those bullets could have instantly taken the life of anyone in its path. Bullets rained down among the workers, and it was a miracle no one was hit. Although a woman standing in a doorway was struck in the legs by shingle, which was ricocheting off in all directions. Had this been the extent of this unplanned event in Brandon, then perhaps it's not even worth remembering 80 years on. However... This was simply the prelude. Another eyewitness, Charlie Wharf, who still lives in the town, was a volunteer air raid precautions messenger during the war. This meant he had to cycle between locations in and around town, often in the hours of darkness, to relay messages of enemy sightings. He also had a day job at Woodrow's Ironmongers on Brandon Market Hill, which is about 100 yards from George Street. On this fateful day, Charlie peered around the corner of the entrance to the Ironmongers to look at the clock on Market Hill. It was getting near his lunchtime too. As he looked across Market Hill, he witnessed the enemy bomber with guns blazing. To this day, he recalls the time as being one minute to one in the afternoon. Supported by eyewitness accounts, we know that the enemy aircraft flew down Thetford Road, over George Street and across Market Hill. The drama now takes a turn for the worse, for there is a short lane whose name indicates why this would be. It runs off Market Hill and goes behind the clock tower. This is School Lane. Back in 1941, on 27th of February, at one minute to one in the afternoon, small children were also enjoying a lunch break and were outside innocently playing in the school playground. They made for easy prey. One bullet pierced through the roof of the cookhouse and the hole remained in the ceiling into the 1970s. More bullets ripped into classroom number three and Ina Espy, a schoolgirl at the time, later recalled to me that she had been in the cookery room that morning but had gone home for lunch. It was a miracle no children were harmed, but had the attack happened earlier, then things might have been different. As it was, parents arrived quickly and removed their children from school. Let me take away any notion that the gunners on the aircraft did not know what they were firing at. If Brandon people could see their faces, then they could see easily that there was children in the schoolyard. Harry Rumsey, another eyewitness, was making his way home from school to have lunch with his family. At the time, home for Harry was about half a mile down London Road, in Coronation Place, and it was near here that he saw the commotion behind him. He turned, saw the bomber flying parallel to London Road and heading out of town towards Lakenheath. He reckons it was still firing its machine guns even then. He crouched down behind a fence out of fear of being spotted by the enemy. No sooner had the aircraft flown over the town than it was gone. There had been no time to react, no chance for self-defence. Colin Blanchard later recalled being a schoolboy during the attack. He too had gone home for lunch, along with an evacuee boy who was staying with him at his family's house. He was then making his way back to school when the aircraft began firing. He later recalled to me via email... The all-clear had not sounded, but our evacuee and me had set off. 
It was the day for my music lesson and I was about to drop off the satchel at the music teacher's house when I noticed a line of factory girls returning to work. Suddenly out of the clouds came a Dornier 17 and started machine gunning the road. I grabbed the evacuee and dived to the ground at the teacher's door. The plane flew by, still firing, and seconds later, so it seemed, my dad appeared on bicycle and escorted us back home. Colin, along with other eyewitnesses, confirmed the aircraft to be a Dornier 17, often referred to as a flying pencil due to its long, slender fuselage. With a crew of four, the pilot would have stayed in this role throughout the mission, but the bomb aimer, navigator and co-pilot would have also manned the machine guns. The low-lying cloud Colin referred to might indicate the bomber had got lost after its mission somewhere over Britain, so perhaps the pilot and navigator may have been trying to identify landmarks on a map to get their crew home safely. Home was likely a Luftwaffe base in occupied Belgium or northern France. It seemed Brandon had simply presented itself as a target of opportunity along the way. However, this was not the extent of enemy action in Brandon during 1941. At just past midnight, in fact just 30 minutes into the morning of Monday the 12th of July 1941, one high explosive bomb landed near Mayday Farm again, bringing down more telephone wires and smashing windows. During that same attack, Brandon itself was targeted with bombs. Ten high explosive bombs exploded along Berry Road and the lower part of Thetford Road. Fortunately, for the most part, these bombs landed in unpopulated farming land. But had they landed on the opposite side of the road, then there would no doubt have been casualties. As it was, the resulting shock wave from the blast was enough to smash windows, shift roof tiles and bring down the plaster from ceilings. Those residents would have been in no doubt how close they'd come to disaster. Since the war started, Brandon residents had become blasé about air raid warnings, but then so had most other rural places. Early in the war, the sound of sirens going off had Brandon people scurrying under tables, in cupboards under the stairs, or, if they had one made for themselves, into a bomb shelter at the bottom of the garden. A few people even went out and sat in one of the pillboxes that had popped up around town, but then it became monotonous. Warnings would go off and all too often came to nothing. This left residents wondering why they even bothered to be all crammed up for hours on end, waiting for the all clear. So, after a while, residents remained in bed, or continued with their work or daily chores when the siren sounded. Complacency set in. Recorded in the school log kept by the Brandon school head teacher, it was noted that four air raid warnings had been sounded on the day the school was attacked. Colin Blanchard even said the all clear had not sounded, and yet everyone was either at work or school when the enemy flew above Brandon. Such attitudes soon changed when the enemy incursions over Brandon increased. If there was ever a reason to believe in guardian angels, then one Brandon resident had cause to believe. Jack Inns, in 1941, was a 15-year-old lad whose family lived at 167 Thetford Road, Brandon. Jack's father, Bill Inns, was a volunteer in Brandon's fire brigade, so Jack's family was fully aware of the dangers of aerial bombing. It was early in the morning of Thursday the 31st of July 1941, when Jack was woken from his sleep by his father. Look, be careful, the siren's gone off, his dad told him. This was the signal for Jack and his family to make their way down to the Morrison shelter, which was basically a metal cage the family would have kept probably in the kitchen for them to climb into and be protected from falling debris. Jack, when retelling me this story, said he was about to get out of bed, but then his first notion that something was wrong was his inability to get out of bed. He looked up and became aware his bedroom window had blown in, there was glass everywhere and the ceiling had come down on top of him. His father immediately reappeared at the door asking Jack if he was all right. He then said the family home had been hit by a bomb. Even when Jack recalled this experience to me, he still had no recollection of hearing a blast or seeing a flash of light. Jack and his father made their way downstairs and it was pitch black so they had to feel their way along. An hour or two later when daylight broke through the gloom, Jack noticed the gas stove which was always at the back of the house as you would expect in the kitchen had been blown across the ground floor and was almost up against the front lounge window. The pantry had collapsed and all the ceilings downstairs, like the one in Jack's bedroom, had come down. 
Beyond the house, their outside toilet had been flattened and reduced to rubble lying in a small crater. There was a second small crater in their back garden as well. They realised they'd come as close as it was possible to be injured without actually being injured. Sadly, their two pet dogs and five rabbits were casualties and had been killed instantly. Jack reckoned it was the next morning when the Royal Air Force personnel from nearby Aria Feltwell arrived at his home to dig around looking for clues as to really what the ordnance was that had been dropped. They found shrapnel and apparently there are still metal splinters in the wall of that house even today. One of the servicemen turned to Jack and said, Well boy, you are very lucky, as if Jack didn't already know that. He continued, If these had been high explosive bombs, then you would not be here today. It seems the bombs that fell against Jack's home were designed to fire out red hot shrapnel rather than explosives, with the servicemen suggesting they could have even been meant for a runway perhaps the airfield at Lakenheath. Perhaps we may never know the intended target for these bombs dropped over Brandon, and like the rest of the country, the town would have been in blackout during the hours of darkness, but perhaps the enemy had seen some light showing from the town, and that was enough to identify a target. The local authorities were doing all they could to educate and restrict residents showing light, but sometimes punishments had to be meted out and the town's magistrates were regularly fining people who drove or cycled around town without shading their lights. Local residents were also brought to book, although Mr Frederick Gentle, a town councillor who lived on the avenue, had his case dismissed when he persuaded the court that his wife had accidentally turned on the wrong switch and illuminated the outside porch instead of a light in the house. Although he got away with this lapse of judgment, you would have thought by 1941... Brandon residents would have gotten the message, especially considering the Brandon magistrates were prosecuting residents for breaking the blackout long before 1941. In fact, long before the Second World War had even started. Back in October 1915, when Zeppelins brought aerial bombing to Britain during the Great War, or the First World War as it became known, Brandon magistrates prosecuted two residents for failing to adhere to the blackout. Edith Clark of the White Hart Hotel in the High Street was fined six shillings and Walter Talbot of the Duke of Wellington pub on Thetford Road was fined two and six. Mr Gentle was a town councillor even back then, so 26 years later, in 1941, you would have hoped that no one was ignorant of what was required during blackout. Nonetheless, whatever the reason for the bombing, there was a silver lining for Jack and his family. While the local council made repairs to their home, Jack's parents lived in rooms downstairs and the children stayed with uncles and aunts. When the repairs were done, Jack returned home and discovered what used to be his outside toilet, basically a brick shed over a pit in the garden which required regular emptying by a man in the cart at night, was gone. Instead, their coal shed adjacent to the house had a flushing toilet installed. Jack's home was the first on Thetford Road to have a flushing toilet. It was not just Jack's family that had been hit, although they had been the closest to losing everything. There are archives in the record office at Berries and Edmonds that list all the properties affected. A house in Gas House Lane belonging to George Philpot, windows and doors damaged. A bungalow in Gas House Lane, ceilings and contents damaged. A garage in Waterworks Road belonging to Frank Kybird, roof, walls damaged, Contents damaged. Engine house of the waterworks belonging to Milton Hall Rural District Council. Slight damage to roof, walls pitted, windows damaged. House the Brandon school log Robert also made reference to, to that night's bombing. Pitted, Bombs dropped on Brandon overnight. Very disturbed night for everyone. Poor attendance in school as a consequence. The morning attendance was only 81 and the afternoon's attendance was 85. They would normally have been closer to 200 children, including evacuees from London attending the school. So with all this information, why have these events from 80 years ago been largely forgotten? To understand this, we must consider the wartime era when they occurred. 145 Thetford Road, belonging to Vic Wharf, roof damaged. 147 Thetford Road, belonging to E.R. Field, ceiling damaged. Two days after the bombing, a local newspaper, the Berry Free Press, reported the incident to its readers, but its description of the event was hindered by censorship. It never named Brandon as the location, but instead stated, 
Bombs were dropped on an East Anglian town in the early hours of Thursday morning by a lone raider. The bombs fell in a direct line running parallel to the high street. It then described how a council house toilet had been flattened and two dogs killed. The report was covered in 90 words and appeared on the bottom of page 5 of the newspaper. If you lived outside Brandon, then you would have never known this referred to the town. Today, any researcher not knowing what happened in Brandon would never connect this report to the town. So you can see why oral histories play such a vital part in our local heritage. 167 Thetford Road belonging to William Inns, roof, walls, ceiling, windows, contents, damaged, outhouse, demolished. Obviously we are thankful that no one was killed or badly injured when the enemy came to Brandon, but elsewhere in the war lives were being taken. In the big picture of a world war, Brandon's drama was insignificant. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission logs 255 deaths of servicemen and women on the day when the German bomber fired its machine guns on Brandon. There are 121 deaths recorded when Berry Road was bombed and another 88 on the day when Jack Innes almost lost his life. D. Blackmore, wall damaged. These numbers do not include civilian lives lost and are only of Commonwealth personnel, so represent a fraction of the total deaths on those days. What of the deaths inflicted by our own forces? This was a time when death was a daily hazard of life and censorship curtailed information reaching beyond local communities. However outrageous these events in Brandon may appear to our peaceful lives today, they were in fact nothing out of the ordinary in 1941. In our busy modern day lives, we may not feel a need to discuss ourselves with family or even ask older generations about their lives, for on the surface there is nothing out of the ordinary to talk about. Perhaps we're missing the point. Just one small nugget of seemingly unimportant information may be a piece of a bigger jigsaw. It may even spark someone to research further. I have been fortunate enough to spend an hour or two chatting to Brandon residents over the years about what happened to them during the war. You will not find their experiences in a history book and sadly most are no longer with us. But their memories live on. Without exception, at the beginning of our chats, each and every one of them said they had nothing exciting to tell me. And yet, they lived through unprecedented times, and each had their own story to tell. Today, we are also living in unprecedented times, which I'm sure will be of interest to future researchers. Colin Blanchard, the young lad who dived into a doorway when he heard the machine gun, he moved to the United States and I lost contact with him over 15 years ago. Ina Espy, who had been in the cookery room just hours before the attack, was living in Wheating, a neighbouring village to Brandon, when I visited her a few years before her death. Jack Inn served in the war as a sapper in the Royal Engineers, constructing temporary bridges in France, Belgium and Germany to replace the ones the retreating Germans had blown up. Sadly, he is no more, although a local school did also interview him for a project where his voice was recorded for future generations. Les Bond, who dived under a truck in the Lime Quarry, he joined the war with the Suffolk Regiment, although by the time he crossed the Rhine in 1945, he had been transferred to the Seaforth Highlanders. He returned home to Brandon after the war, but didn't stay long and set off for a new life in Australia, where he remained until his death in 2016. Harry Rumsey, who hid behind a fence, is still with us, although his health is in decline. Charlie Wharf, who checked the time on the Market Hill, he still lives in Brandon and is perhaps the one person held in highest esteem by the town's modern day residents. He is still sharp-witted, funny and recalls with clarity many events in Brandon from during his lifetime. Without their memories, there is no story to tell. So it is to them that I dedicate this to. Thank you for listening.